So welcome everyone to our August webinar. Our topic today is on the 18th century schools for the free and the enslaved. And just to set it off a little bit, we're gonna do a little Charleston trivia and you can put your answers if you have them in the chat. So first question is, what is the size of a football field and a half? What is located at Gatson's Wharf? What has nine galleries? Who has a Center for Family History that will provide educational programs for visitors, both young and old? And then the last question is, who has membership opportunities? So all the answers to these questions can be found at iaamuseum.org slash events. So if you got it right, you can go double check to see, to have that little victory for yourself. Just a few reminders that this session is being recorded and it will be available at a later date on our website and or our YouTube channel. Please keep yourself muted and their video turned off during the presentation and discussion. Closed caption is available if you wish. And if you have any questions during the discussion, please put them in the Q&A box and we'll get to them at the end of the discussion or as we're going if we have time. And just want to put it out there already, our next month webinar is on September 23rd at 1 p.m. And it's Tracing Roots, How Universities Are Discovering Descendants of Enslaved Flavors. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing and we're going to go ahead and share our panelists. So, Nicole, why don't you go first and introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. I am delighted to be here with you this Saturday afternoon. My name is Nicole Brown, and I wear several different hats or caps, depending on where you meet me. So today, I am speaking to you as the graduate student um, lab assistant at William & Mary's Bray School Lab, which is an interdisciplinary um, partnership um, program that looks really at the history of Bray schools more broadly, but the Williamsburg Bray School in particular, which we'll talk about today. I'm also a program manager at Colonial Williamsburg, and I portray one of the teachers at a Bray school in what was known as British North America in the 18th century. And then Tanya, just go ahead and introduce yourself next. Hi, my name is Tanya Meredith. I'm the oil historian for the Bray School Lab. I have the wonderful opportunity to interview uh, the descendant and the descendant community of the uh, Bray School scholars, um, also the project partners, architecturists, archaeologists that have been working on this project. Um, I came this route uh, from Houston, Texas, had the opportunity to work on some projects there with the descendant community as well. Um, but uh, today I'll be talking about how I uh, my, talking about my journey to discover that I was um, what, what genealogists would consider collateral descendancy of the Bray School scholars. So Tanya and I are both incredibly excited to talk to you today. Um, for context, I am a graduate student in particular at William & Mary. That's probably not surprising since I work at William & Mary's Bray School Lab. But I am a PhD student in American studies. And what my work really centers on is looking at not just the Williamsburg Bray School, which is one of several different Bray schools that were meant for free and enslaved students in British North America prior to the American Revolution, but really looking at lots and lots of different um, schools that were funded for enslaved and free Black peoples um, to have education. Now, that education could have many different charged and various meanings, which we are definitely going to talk about today. Um, and it's just honestly an absolute pleasure to be able to work with Tanya and to work at the Bray School Lab and to share this history with you today. So uh, as Whitney said, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat box. And if you need anything, we promise we'll provide contact information and a further reading list if you would like to go through your own exploration. So talking about 18th century education for free and enslaved African Americans, I think initially what you should know is that, and many of you probably already do, there are far more schools for free and enslaved African Americans in the 18th century, especially in British North America, so where we think of the 13 colonies being, um, throughout the 18th century. The earliest schools are really coming about in the 
early part of the 18th century. One of the earliest ones is in New York City that starts in 1704. And there are schools that run throughout this time period. So if we were to just talk about every single school or every single type of education that was available either legally or subversively or through Black community members themselves throughout the 18th century to free and enslaved African Americans, we could easily be here for three or four hours talking. So long story short, there are schools everywhere from Georgia all the way up to, I've seen schools in New York City, um, in Newport, Rhode Island. Most of these schools though are funded by religious organizations. And when I say religious organizations, I wanna give you some context for that. So British North America is obviously part of the British empire, which means that really most of the colonies at this point in time, British colonies have an established church. In the Northern colonies, it's really congregationalist. Uh, in the Southern colonies, it's predominantly church of England. Um, and so funding in particular in the colonial South, which is where I tend to specialize in studying different schools, is almost exclusively funded either by the Church of England or as we move into the mid 18th century to the Baptists in particular. So being funded by religious organizations and religious institutions, it means these schools have a very specific ideology and bent that sometimes we see um, not always widely accepted amongst not just the colonial South, but all of the British North American colonies. And in many cases, we do actually see enslaved and free Black students in their communities actively resisting the instruction they're receiving because most of these religious denominations are pro-slavery at this point in time, in particular, when we're looking at Protestant denominations, the Church of England. But what we know is that students made meaning because and despite of the instruction. There are lots of different books and sources you can look to to learn about all of these schools. And so I actually want to give you two sources I highly recommend that are almost 100 years apart, but both wonderful reads. One of them, of course, was written by Carter G. Woodson. If you now are familiar with Black History Month, he started Negro History Week in the early part of the 20th century. And he also wrote many different books, The Miseducation of the Negro being one, but The Education of the Negro prior to 1861, which is the official title, is one book I'd recommend you look at in particular chapter two really talks about 18th century schools. And then another one, if you want to look more particularly at the Church of England, and we're going to talk a lot today about the Church of England, how different religious charitable organizations funded 18th century education for free and enslaved African Americans, and where that appeared. Um, but Travis Glasson's Mastering Christianity is another great place to look to see where all of these schools ended up. So oftentimes, if you're looking to understand 18th century education for free and enslaved African Americans, you need to look predominantly, especially in British North America, at Protestant religious organizations, because there's not a separation between church and state. That's why so much of what we understand about education is through understanding different religious groups, their minute meetings, their records, and other types of affiliations with the Church of England or Protestant denominations. And and education. So when we're talking particularly today, let's talk a little bit about how the British Empire is defining education. I'm going to get into more specific schools in just a minute. So I'm going to talk a little bit about one school in particular that was actually in Charleston, right where the International Museum for African Americans is located. And then I'm going to focus exclusively after that on looking at Bray schools, which I'll unpack in a minute. But to understand all of these schools, we have to understand how education is defined. Now, obviously, we all know that education is a universal idea. If I ask you, what do you think about education? Um, and, and this is a question I ask people a lot as an academic and a public historian. You know, people don't say, oh, I don't know what education is. They say, no, I have a very clear idea of what it is. However, that does not mean that everyone has the same definition, nor are they defining its value in the same way. And that is really important when we talk about education today in the 18th century, because what you're seeing is the organizations that fund these schools, um, enslavers and dominant white populations in urban and rural environments, and then the free black or enslaved communities and their children themselves often have very different opinions on the value of this education. But if we're looking at education, I find this fascinating. 
I always go back to the Oxford English Dictionary and Samuel Johnson's Dictionary, which is one of sort of the critical British American dictionaries in the 18th century. And interestingly, their definition of education is pretty much the same, which in this case, this definition comes from the Oxford English Dictionary, but it is the process of bringing up the manner in which a young person was brought up with reference to social station, kinds of manners or habits acquired, calling or employment prepared for. And what that really means is that education is not always meant to progress children forward into elevated positions. It's meant to indoctrinate people into the hierarchical expectations of the British Empire. Now, what we also know from looking at written records such as runaway ads, correspondence, minute meetings, and other documents connected to these schools is that students are actively resisting this definition. They're saying, thank you, but no thank you. I am going to take this education and make meaning of it despite the hierarchical, um, and when I say hierarchy, I also mean there's gender and racial and religious and class parameters that are expected of these students. They're often resisting that. But it's important to understand this definition because it is the standard definition, according to the OED, for education in the British Empire from 1531 until 1844. That is a very long time to define education this way. And so when we're studying or trying to understand and really appreciate the human experience, the agentive experience of black children who came through these schools, we also have to understand what they're up against. And they're up against this very hierarchical regimented education system. Um, and I think in order to really talk about our schools, it's gonna be important to understand that. So we are going to talk about Dr. Thomas Bray in a second, but I want to talk rather than just about Dr. Thomas Bray as a figure of the Bray Associates, who I'll discuss in a minute, as also a figure in two other very large charities, one of which has a direct impact on schools for Black children in Charleston. So Reverend Dr. Thomas Bray was an incredibly powerful, prominent figure in the 18th century British Atlantic world, but in particular within the Church of England. So the Bishop of London, and the Bishop of London, just so you know, is the bishop that is meant to represent all of the British North American colonies. He appoints Reverend Dr. Thomas Bray as his first commissary. Commissaries are almost administrative assistants in the 18th century because the British... Um, well, the Bishop of London is living in London and he's not visiting the colonies. So he appoints what he calls commissaries to go to each colony and report back to him on what is happening, not just within the Church of England, but the Church of England as it relates to government, as it relates to society, since they're all interconnected. And Thomas Bray is the first person he appoints to Maryland. And actually it is Reverend Dr. Thomas Bray who in 1703 changes the law across the British empire to change Maryland from being a Catholic colony to a Protestant one. And so Thomas Bray has deep roots within the Church of England, trying to spread the Church of England to be the dominant religion within the British Empire. But he realizes that there's a difference between just changing the law and setting up charitable organizations that hold the power and the money to send textbooks and books and libraries to these colonies. And he's sending them with a specifically Protestant ilk. And so he sends over 34,000 religious books and tracts to what we now know as the United States of America before he dies really uh, in the 1730s, uh, which is extraordinary. Uh, and just so you know, there is a typo at the top. He lived from 1758 until 1730. Um, in fact, several times he thought he was going to shuffle off this mortal coil, but lasted for quite a long time. In fact, he's known in his 80s, he has um, other Anglican Church of England ministers complaining about how active he is in his 80s. He'll wake up and he'll go and give a, a, a sermon and then he'll go do prison reform and then he funds all these charities. But the three largest charities that he funds end up being the organizations that really have the stronghold over Black education in Black schools in British North America. So you have the Society for the Promotion of Christian Knowledge, also known as the SPCK. It is still in existence today. They publish all the textbooks that the other two organizations will use. 
The second organization he founds is the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel in Foreign Parts, known today as the USPG. And actually, it is this organization that between 1743 and 1774 pays for an, a formal Black school in Charleston, where they actually purchase two young boys who are 14 and 15 years old named Andrew and Harry, who they train as enslaved young adolescents, um, eventually moving into adulthood as men, to be enslaved teachers at these schools who teach hundreds of students in Charleston. Again, a pro-slavery school, but what you see with Andrew and Harry later on in their lives as they move into their adulthood is they seem to be resisting this pro-slavery instruction in really palpable, powerful ways. Um, and then the last organization is the Associates of Dr. Bray. So what ends up happening is although there are schools for Black children in Charleston and other places sponsored by the SPG, you see a lot of white supremacy and racism come into play. And so SPG supporters saying, well, we actually want all this money to go to white children and not Black children. And this comes to a head and eventually Thomas Bray funds the Bray Associates specifically in order to have an official organization for the education and what he perceives as conversion of enslaved and free Africans, African Americans, and Native Americans, um, or indigenous peoples, more widely within the British Atlantic world. They initially merge with the trustees of Georgia, and so some of their earliest work is in Georgia after slavery is allowed with in Georgia from the 1750s moving onward. And they eventually, after about 20 years of arguing how to spend their money, set up formal charity schools in British North America. So just to recap, you have the SPCK, SPCK who is sending textbooks worldwide. You have the SPG who is prior to the Bray Associates where most of the funding within the Church of England is coming for education for enslaved and free black students. Then you have the Bray Associates, who we're going to talk about a little bit more because Tanya and I spend a great deal of time exploring, studying, learning from the descendants of, and trying to better understand the legacy and the history of the Bray schools, and in particular, the one in Williamsburg, Virginia. In addition to this, though, you have some other key players, you know, in the Spanish colonies, you do have the Catholic Church funding different types of instruction. Not my area of expertise, but certainly if you look at different books that have been written by wonderful scholars, you can learn more about it. And then you also have the Baptists coming in and eventually the Methodists who are leading to a very different kind of religious instruction and education for free and enslaved Black children and adults as we move into the latter part of the 18th century. So all this is to say, when I said we could really spend three or four hours talking about this, it's because there are actually so many different schools out there. And we're not even talking about what would be defined in the British Atlantic world as informal schools, which is actually enslaved communities getting together who are already literate, already trying to continue their literacy. And, you know, in, in private, at night, even against legal codes as we move into the antebellum period, since most reading and writing is banned in um, the United States as we know it starting in the early 19th century, with the exception, of course, of Georgia and, and really South Carolina, interestingly, in 1741. Um, but they are meeting outside of any sort of legal education systems prior to, during, and after all of these formal schools that I've mentioned. So let's talk a little bit about the Bray Associates. We're going to spend the rest of our time talking a little bit more about the Bray Associates who funded and paid for the Bray schools, understanding where those schools were, who went to those schools, what the curriculum was, and ultimately then leaning into what Tanya's going to talk about, which is the legacy of that um, in her own family amongst descendant communities, and how do we talk about this type of story in its fullness, not shying away from the pro-slavery and the ugly aspects of these schools, while also elevating and highlighting the ingenuity and brilliance and strength of the children who came through these schools and made meaning despite of the instruction, even when it was pro-slavery. In order to talk about that, though, we really have to talk about the ideology of the Bray Associates.
And one of the best places to learn more about that is in the one religious tract that they ever published. They sent many, many, many different books across the world, but the only one they ever published was in 1770. Um, and what I'm going to do, some of you may be more verbal learners, so you prefer to read. Much to the chagrin of my own mother, I am an auditory learner, I am a talker. Um, but for those of you who prefer a different learning style, I'm going to read out the bolded parts, but you can read in its entirety while I'm talking. So this is specifically what the Bray Associates write as to the ideology behind their Bray schools. Quote, I propose that you should have your slaves instructed in the Christian religion as the best mean to reconcile them to their state of servitude rendering it more easily and supportable to them, he means enslaved people. It is the natural effect of such instruction to turn the eye service of slaves into the conscientious diligence of servants. Over 80 copies of this were sent worldwide in 1771, two different Bray schools, with the largest number actually being sent to Williamsburg, Virginia, which at that time not only had the Williamsburg Bray School, one of the few Bray schools to run for a long period of time in the colonial south, but it also, of course, was the capital city of Virginia, the colony of Virginia. What I find interesting about this textbook, though, is that it conceals as much as it reveals. Textbooks often reflect what people want you to think, not necessarily what people are actually thinking. And I find it interesting that the Bray School, many Bray Schools, but in particular the Williamsburg Bray School, which had been opened for a decade at this point, that they have to send a textbook where effectively they're saying, and this is corroborated by other letters, the instruction we were hoping to receive, i.e. their methodology for these schools, which I just quoted to you, is not actually aligning with what's happening on the ground. So keep that in mind, that balance is really important as we're talking about black education and specifically young scholars, young black free and enslaved scholars who are attending these schools. So the Bray schools, Initially, I mentioned the Bray Associates take about 20 years to argue amongst themselves how they're going to spend the money Reverend Dr. Thomas Bray has raised for them um, for the purpose of Black education. Initially, they start by sending missionaries to plantations in the colonial South, in particular Georgia, South Carolina, um, New York, actually, interesting, interestingly, and um, it, none of that is working. So what they're finding is that enslavers and plantation owners are refusing or rejecting the instruction. And so what they actually end up doing is they reach out to someone who you likely are familiar with, Benjamin Franklin of Philadelphia. When he is visiting London in 1757, they reach out to him and they say, you're very charitable and well-connected. And we are wondering how you think we should spend this money. We are leaning towards, in fact, having schools in urban environments. So to give this some context for you, um, education means many different things, obviously. It means many different things religiously, from a literacy standpoint. Um, there are racial gender class aspects to it, but there are also regional aspects to it as well. And very often you see enslavers capitalizing on the brilliance of enslaved people um, in different scenarios. Uh, how I always word it is somebody who can know how to spot a tobacco worm in Virginia, it's likely an enslaved person, on a 13-month crop that is an education unto itself. That's not something I know how to do. Um, somebody in an urban environment who maybe is expected within the conditions of their enslavement to know reading and writing for serving as a cook or a waiting man or a footman. Um, very often you see region impacts the types of educational opportunities that free and enslaved black peoples will have. Um, Charleston's another great example. There's a very, very high literacy rate in Charleston as there is in Williamsburg amongst the enslaved and free black population because urban environments have a different set of education parameters within the institution of slavery. Now, obviously that doesn't include how enslaved people themselves see their instruction and the incredible strength and tenacity and ingenuity of these communities to find education despite and sometimes even in relation to what's happening um, with other systems around them. 
So I only mention that because they reach out to Benjamin Franklin and he agrees with them. He says, I agree with you. I think schools for enslaved and free black children in urban environments will get you the traction you need amongst enslavers who are unwilling or reticent or quite frankly, um, in many cases, concerned that education will not benefit them, right? So there is an economic component to this here, especially um, in urban environments. And so of course he recommends Philadelphia as the first place for a brave school. In fact, he sends one of his own enslaved people by the name of Othello to the Philadelphia Bray School. I don't know much about Othello other than he attended the school around 1758. He was likely six or seven years old. And I am working with descendant community members in Philadelphia at St. Thomas's Church to try to learn more about the Philadelphia Bray School in their community. Um, and Michael Idris is a wonderful person if you are connected to Philadelphia in any way and you want to learn more about these schools, myself or Michael Idris, we're more than happy to talk to you. So Philadelphia is the first Bray School. Um, then you have New York City, also a pro-slavery Bray School like Philadelphia, also running for a long period of time. Um, and it's run in relation to Trinity Church, which is still in New York City. Then you have Newport, Rhode Island. Um, you after that have then Williamsburg and Fredericksburg. But outside of these five key schools, you have libraries that are being sent everywhere. They're being sent to Woodbridge, New Jersey. They're being sent all the way down to um, uh, coastal counties in North Carolina. They're being sent to Accomack County in Virginia. So just because there might not have been a Bray school in your area does not mean that books were not sent there for the purpose of disseminating them amongst enslaved populations and that those enslaved communities used those textbooks in ways that might have even been very often antithetical to what the Bray Associates had intended. So we can talk more about that in the Q&A if you want. Just know there's a lot out there. Again, I could probably talk for hours and hours and hours about the Williamsburg Bray School as Tanya knows, who is a very patient colleague of mine. If you wanna learn more specifically about the Williamsburg Bray School, you can always go to Ben Franklin's World, which is now a Colony Williamsburg um, podcast. And episode 331, myself, Dr. Maureen Eldersman Lee, who is the director of William and Mary's Bray School Lab, and Ron Hurst, who is one of the vice presidents at Colony Williamsburg, talk a little bit more about how we know what we know, especially as it relates to some of you may know, we recently, I won't say discovered, I will say rediscovered the Williamsburg Bray School and it has been moved now to a location and will be opened to the public as a historic site starting next September, free of charge to the public. But we know the school operated between 1760 and 1774. It ran for 14 years. It was the longest formal school that I know of in Virginia for free or enslaved Black children that ran. Um, obviously, in Hanover County, you have Baptists and Baptist ministers preaching the word of God and offering instruction in a very different way. You have other itinerant ministers, free and enslaved, black and white, throughout the colony of Virginia. But when it comes to a formal school that has continuous operation and funding, the Williamsburg Bray School in Virginia is one of the largest in the colonial South. That alongside, I would argue, the Charleston SPG School. Um, numbers have varied on this, but Tanya and I agree that around 300 students, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less, but I would argue around 300 students, enslaved and free, attended this school. Instruction included reading. Some academics argue writing wasn't taught. My research, my ongoing research shows that writing was taught because writing, spelling, orthography, ciphering, account keeping, arithmetic, and marking are all different things in the 18th century. So it all depends on what definition you're looking at. But we know spelling was taught at the school and in the 18th century, the definition for spelling is the teaching of writing of words. Writing in the 18th century actually means composition. So we know that writing in terms of how it's used in the spelling definition was taught at the school. Sewing, knitting, etiquette, Keep in mind though, etiquette's a very racially charged term, right? When you're talking about the young boys and girls who are six and seven years old on average who are going to any of these Bray schools, etiquette means um, knowing when to sit and stand, how to wait at table. Um, and so 
please keep in mind, and I only say this just because I talk with a lot of guests and visitors in Williamsburg, I don't want etiquette to come across as this thing that is charming or cutesy. Um, there's a lot of racial connotation to it, and there's a lot of socio-political class elements to it as well. Um, we also know that there was a sole teacher. Her name was Ann Wager. That is the person I portray at Colonial Williamsburg. She was white, and most of the Bray School teachers were white prior to the American Revolution. However, for a very brief period of time, my research has recently shown me, many Bray School teachers after the American Revolution, prior to Nat Turner's rebellion, were self-emancipated Black loyalists. We can talk about that more if you want. And then we know that the scholars made meeting because and despite of their instruction. So that's a long way of saying I could talk ad infinitum about the Bray School in Williamsburg, Bray Schools, different schools, but I really wanna hand it over to my brilliant colleague, Tanya Meredith, who's gonna tell you a little bit more about her history and experience and her work. Thank you, Nicole. Hello, everyone. Um, so yes, this portion of the seminar is going to be on my research into uh, my Armistead genealogy. Um, <clears throat> so for the, the next slide, uh, my Armistead genealogy begins with my maternal grandmother, Ora Geneva Caldwell Ingram. Um, at this time, I'd like to honor her and speak her name and uh, the other names of my ancestors into this space, Ora Geneva, Melissa, Jeff, and Lewis. They lived in Lauderdale County, Alabama, but at family reunions, the elders would tell us that our families came from Virginia. <clears throat> on the next screen, or next slide, <laughs> on a family road trip to Virginia in 2013, we stopped in Williamsburg and I noticed familiar names in the city on historic buildings and street signs, including Armistead. It's not a common name like Jones or Smith or Miller, but it stood out to me. Um, so it was on this trip that I learned about the Bray School. And I was so intrigued by the story that I returned on August 22nd, 2013, and I took a picture of the school. So in three days, I will celebrate my Brayversary. <laughs> 10 years ago, 10 years to August 22nd is when I found the Bray School. Um, so the next, the next slide, uh, the Bray School inspired me to return to, to college and finish my master's degree in history. And two weeks after I graduated, I moved to Williamsburg and began working as a historic interpreter at, Col at Colonial Williamsburg. While at CW, I attended a training seminar on the Bray by Nicole Brown. <laughs> and that is the first time I saw the list of the students' names from the rosters of the school. I noticed that one of the students, Locus, was sent to the school by a member of the Armistead family. And I wondered if there was a connection because I remember the story of my ancestors being from Virginia. The only, the oldest member from the family uh, that I recall was Jeff Armistead. So I asked my mom if she knew who his father was and she did not. She gave me the number of an Armistead relative, however, who produced a, a written history of the Armistead family. And the document is on the next slide. This document stated that the Armisteads, Armisteads were slaves on the plantation of Peter and Betsy Armistead. From there, I did a search for Peter Armistead and located a research report on the home that he built in Lauderdale County. It stated that he was from Culpeper County, Virginia and had moved to Lauderdale County in 1828. This document also contained a persistent oral tradition that he and his wife separated due to his illicit relations with slave women on the plantation that resulted in a number of mulatto offspring. This corroborates the oral history in my family that Jeff Armistead's father, Lewis, was the son of Peter Armistead and his enslaved woman, Luvenia. From there, I searched for Peter's lineage. Several works and books have been produced on the Armistead family as they are considered by some to be members of the FFBs, the First Families of Virginia. One work was done by William and Mary President Lyon Tyler whose grandmother Mary was an Armistead. According to Tyler's research, Peter's Armistead's, Peter Armistead's cousin, Ellison Armistead's widow, Jane Anderson Armistead, sent locusts to the Bray. Also included in this lineage was Bray administrator Robert Carter Nicholas. His mother was an Armistead, making he and Peter Armistead's cousin, cousins as well. Robert Carter Nicholas sent two students to the Bray, Hannah and Sarah. At this time, I do not know if I'm a direct descendant, but my current genealogy confirms that I am descended through a collateral line, several collateral lines of the families that sent students to the Bray School. So, oh, yep. oh, so Tanya and I just have a great, I actually was just 
processing it because Tanya and I spend a lot of time together. And every time I feel so lucky to work at a place like William and Mary's Bray School Lab, because every time we get together, just listening to you, Tanya, is such a gift and a joy. And it's very humbling to be part of a community, a growing community, where the work is based on not just understanding the past, but seeing how it connects to the present. So I was wondering, actually, do you want to talk a little bit more about Descendant Outreach Week? Um, since that's actually one of the photos that you're seeing in front of you is a group of Bray School descendants. Um, and we did a walking tour this last spring to talk about the Bray School, which is the building behind us in that photograph. Right. So uh, back in April, we had um, Descendant Outreach Week where we had those that we that have identified as um, descendant community members, descendants. Um, several of the families there are represented um, we have a family of, of free students on the roster, uh, the Ashby's, the Jones, and some of those uh, represented in that picture are descended from those families. Um, so on that, uh, that was a Saturday that we had the um, the tour of Colonial Winsburg, where we went to some of the homes that the students lived in um, and showed the descendant community where they would have walked from those homes to the Bray School um, and just gave a little bit of information about the families that that enslaved them, just to give them an idea of what the day in the life of a student uh, was like. Yeah, and so continuing for us, um, identification, but also service to the descendant communities and the communities connected to the Bray School are a core part of the work for Tanya and myself. So what does that mean? Well, for me, it means as I'm doing research, I then liaison with Tanya, Elizabeth Drembis, who was our wonderful genealogist. And if you think you might be connected to the Williamsburg Bray School or just generally have a genealogy question, Elizabeth is a great point of contact. Um, you know, I reach out with them and Dr. Lee, who is all of our bosses and say, okay, how do we turn this into descendant facing work? So we have a digital map called Adam and Fanny's World that takes you through a day in the life of Adam and Fanny, two enslaved students who attended the Brace School and were enslaved by the College of William and Mary. We have a digital map on the Colonial Williamsburg website that gives you a list of where every single Bray School student lived that we know of, the house, the location. In the case, I'm so excited to say this, in the case of 20% of the students, we can identify at least one parent, if not a sibling. Um, so we're constantly working to not just understand this school, but then see how with that work we can better serve the communities that are most impacted by the school, which are the descendants in particular. Mm -hmm. so, so that being said, uh, if you want to connect with us, if you have any questions, whether it's about 18th century education for free and enslaved students, about the Williamsburg Bray School, about anything, um, I will not speak for Tanya, but for me, I will literally talk about anything you want to talk about. You can always reach us at braylab at wm.edu. We also have a recommended reading list that will be sent out via email to all of you later about all the things we've talked about. And if you're ever in Williamsburg, the picture that you see in front of you is Travis House. Travis House is where our offices are and the Barad House behind it. So always feel free to come in and ask us questions. Anything you want to add, Tanya? Uh, the only thing I wanted to add is I know a lot of times uh, when uh, individuals engage in this search for um, their their ancestors, uh, that we hit roadblocks and things, and, and sometimes they may not have a document like I did with an oral history. Um, I spoke with a genealogist prior to the seminar, um, just in case there was a question about that. And um, one of the things that she uh, recommended is, you know, without the without the presence of an oral history, that can can lead you back to a, an ancestor. In my case, um, she said one avenue to pursue is to look at the white families um, that with the same last name in the county that your family is from, um, or at Jasic County, um, and also know that. Uh, the the your your ancestor may not have taken the name of um, of their enslavers. It may be the name of a previous enslaver. Um, so a lot of times those roadblocks can be overcome just with some of that bit of information because uh, unfortunately not not everybody will have you know an oral history that will tie them back to a family member. Yeah, that's such a good point, Tanya. And, you know, Elizabeth always has great suggestions on where to look for sources, yes. how to look at them. And we're all here to support you if you have any questions. So just guess kind of start the Q 
Q&A portion of it. So what type of records, when you're looking for like researching them on the schools, and also Tanya, what type of records did you look at when you were doing your genealogical research to kind of help get you back there to kind of match up with the oral history you had? Go for it. Which record you want me to go for? Okay. No, no, sorry. Go ahead. No, go you go ahead first, Tony. Because she asked yours first. <laughs> well, here's what I'll say. Okay. When I'm looking at records to try to understand 18th century Black education from multiple perspectives, but to really get a sense of where was this instruction, what the lived experience might have been like, religious records are deeply deeply helpful and deeply important. Because we don't have a separation between church and state, really, and even up, at, even when we have it in 1787, it's a fight. It's a fight throughout many, many colonies, especially in the colonial South. Um, although Massachusetts is the final state to give up its sort of religious connections in 1848. Um, you really want to go back and look at parish records. Mm -hmm. So records of a specific church or parish um, that connects churches to you. Um, looking at the ministers of those churches, they may be writing about what's happening in their community, Black and white, free and enslaved. So many of the places I look to understand Black education in Virginia, interestingly, uh, are all in England. So remember how I mentioned the Bishop of London? He's constantly corresponding with ministers in Virginia and they all send him records and they've ended up in a place called Lambeth Palace Library. He sent out questionnaires in 1723 and number seven on the questionnaire was how many people of, he doesn't say it this way, but I will, how many people of African descent do you have in your community? Are they being educated? It's one of the earliest examples we have for anywhere, he sent them to all of the British colonies. We've got them for South Carolina, we've got them for Maryland, we have them for Pennsylvania, where they're actually talking about community members, black community members, enslaved and free in the education they're receiving. So oftentimes you really wanna take a look at those religious records. Don't assume though they'll be in your state. You might have to find them overseas, but as digitization improves, very often you can find them just by getting onto your computer. And for me, the some of the records that I found were kind of happenstance, um, not not a path that a lot of genealogists may may go down. Um, I began just a Google search for Peter Armistead, which and I put in Peter Armistead Lauderdale County, and that's how I got back the report. And it was done by a University of Alabama student who was doing a report, report actually on his house because they were trying to figure out why there were tidewater cottages in Northern Alabama. So the report was actually on the house, but that's where the oral history was in, was the report because the house ended up eventually being placed on the national register. So um, whenever those reports have all kinds of information in them, and that's how I ended up with that oral history. Um, the genealogist that we work with, Elizabeth Drimbus, she helped me find the land record for Peter Armistead. Um, that actually helped us see the migration pattern uh, when a lot of the Virginia families went south. Um, they stopped in other places. Um, created plantations in other states. So he actually went through Tennessee, Kentucky <laughs> before he ended up in Alabama. So that produced more records. Um, and then again, the census records and then also the uh, references um, that were posted in the uh, slide, I think the reference to the family genealogy done by Lion Tyler, Tyler and several, several other family members. <clears throat> Are there any documents listing like students' name, the teacher names, and who the Abrea Associates were, and also with the SVG schools and SPK schools as well? Yes, they're very detailed. Um, and if it's okay with you, I'd like to name as many of the names, at least of the scholars that I can remember from the <laughs> schools. So again, what you what's really going to be helpful is the Church of England archives and records. Travis Glasson's book, Mastering Christianity, talks more broadly about a lot of different scholars from the SBG school. So Andrew and Harry, who were 14 and 15 and were enslaved by the Church of England. And Harry ended up teaching at the school and running it for 32 years in Charleston. Um, I don't have a last name for him, but I'm trying to learn more about him right now. Um, you have people like Robin, who unfortunately was executed. He was murdered um, during a slave uprising or an enslaved revolt, I should say, in 1712 in New York, who was connected to Elias Now's Bray School. But they are very detailed. So this is one of the reasons also why I think they're not as well known. So 
as many religious organizations, they are finally coming to a reckoning with their own relationship to slavery and enslavement. So the Church of England did not formally apologize for its role in slavery, its purchase of an, a, pl a plantation known as Codrington Plantation in Barbados, where they owned enslaved individuals, until 2006. When that happened at the annual synod, and the Archbishop of Canterbury said, we share the, sh the shame and sin of our predecessors, and what we need to do is reckon with it, all of a sudden these archives opened up and people were able to have a lot more access to them. So there are hundreds of names. Um, when it comes to Bray schools post-American Revolution, there are over a hundred lists of students in Philadelphia, in Nassau, in um, Halifax and Digby and Preston and Shelburne, Nova Scotia, hundreds of names um, and community names too. Um, so, you know, one of the things I'd recommend is if you can, if you're, if you, and if you want to reach out to us and you're like, could you please send me the lists of X students, whatever you need, if I can provide it, I will provide it for you. Um, I'm sure, you know, Tanya would say the same. If we don't know how to get access to it, we can find who you need to talk to. Um, but there are lots of names of students, their ages, in particular with the Williamsburg Bray School because that's the one I, I tend to focus on the most. We have three student lists that are extant out of the 14 years, 1762, 1765, and 1769. On those lists are 86 individual names, people like Aggie and Sam and Roger, who were enslaved at uh, Peyton Randolph's house. Peyton Randolph was um, a very prominent legal figure in Virginia. Um, you have people like Mary and Harry, who are enslaved at Thomas Everard's house. Reverend Horrocks enslaved a young girl by the name of Charlotte. Um, you have Grace, who was enslaved by one of the wives of the presidents at William and Mary. We're trying to learn more about all of these students. Sometimes I only have a last name. Sometimes I have more. Isaac, Joanna, and Clara B., who are all between the ages of six and nine when they attended the Bray School. Their father, John Insco B., was a free man and maybe a shoemaker in Williamsburg. But the list goes on. So that's a long way of saying there's a lot out there. In the SPG records, a lot of these lists exist. A lot of the records of who the teachers were, what they were teaching, correspondence, that's how we know about Andrew and Harry. With the Bray Associates, there are lots of lists. And because that's the one organization I specialize in studying, I will tell you there's a lot still there that we are actually working on getting online. So if you were to visit William & Mary's Bray School Lab and you were to go to our research portal, as we transcribe all of the documents connected with the Williamsburg Bray School, we're starting with Williamsburg and Virginia first. We're making them open access to you so that they're not behind a paywall. Part of this has had a lot to do with our descendant outreach work of, you know, a descendant shouldn't have to spend $1,800 on a book that's out of print, because that's the only book currently that has these transcriptions in it, to get access to the names of their ancestors. So the lab is really working very hard. I'm working with students constantly to transcribe as many documents as we can and get them online. We're also going to be putting audio recordings up for all of these transcriptions if you're more of an auditory learner like me. So where, if you can just touch again, where the rec records are located, the like main spots in the U.S. and then also over in England. So when people are getting started, the main place to go look to get started at. Sure. Sorry, I got so excited. Great places to start would be your own library. Interlibrary loan is a great and useful tool. If you can get this book, Religious Philanthropy and Colonial Slavery by John Van Horn has all the transcriptions of Bray School correspondence, including student lists from 1723 to 1777. British online archives, if you can get access to their database, a lot of universities near you will have access to this database, has everything from 1777 to 1976. Um, other things that you will want to take a look at, um, the, the library company in Philadelphia, they have a lot of Bray School information. UVA actually has some of the Williamsburg Bray School correspondence, Lambeth Palace Library, and the University of Oxford is where many of those documents are housed. They're still continuing to digitize them, but reaching out to a friendly librarian and seeing if you can get access to something that you need from the University of Oxford or Lambeth Palace Library is always a great place to start.
Do you have any suggestions on how to try to connect research to descendants communities and how to reach out and find the descendant communities? If you want to take that one, Tanya. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was trying to get some of the ones in the chat. <laughs> so do you have any suggestions on how to try to connect research to descendants communities and to reach out and how to find the descendant communities of the different schools? Right. Um, I believe that uh, Nicole showed it on the last slide, um, the contact information for the Bray School Lab. Um, uh, reach out to us and yes, we can do all of that for anyone who is interested in, in trying to see if they may uh, be descendants or just to learn more about um, our research methods, the genealogy, um, or, or just any, type, any of the work that we're doing right now. Are there many records for of schools attempts possibly in Norfolk? Well, I was actually just answering that question. <laughs> we do actually have some very detailed letters, one in particular. Um, there was an attempt of funding a Norfolk Bray School. It did not happen. And it's actually one of the most detailed letters we have in the Bray Associates records for exactly why for mostly racial tension reasons, the schools were not funded. However, we do also know the list of books that was sent. And because it's part of the Virginia project that we're working on at the Bray School Lab, we're hopefully this semester going to be working on transcribing those correspondences and getting them online sooner than later. But if you have any particular questions about the Norfolk Bray School, the Fredericksburg Bray School, or Bray Schools across Virginia or the Colonial South, or actually anywhere, you can always email us at braylab at wm.edu. Um, but the earliest correspondence starts in 1761 and really stops abruptly in 1762 when the minister says, we cannot have a school here and here's exactly why. And he's very explicit, but also illuminating. It tells us a lot about the enslaved population there um, and the free black community. Are there any specific stories or examples on how students and teachers showed resistance at the various schools? Yes. Do you want to talk about that first, Tanya? <laughs> Wait, I was going to do Isaac B. Were you going to? Yes. Oh, no, I'll do that. <laughs> So we do have an example um, of one student that attended the school, Isaac B. Uh, there was a runaway ad place for him. Um, about how many years later, ten, Nicole, 10, 15 years later, um, there's a runaway ad place for him by his owner, uh, Louis Burwell. And in that ad, it states that he can read and possibly write and thinks he has a right to his freedom. Um, so that's one uh, example that I was going to, to answer that with. But Nicole, if you wanted to elaborate more on that. Yeah, absolutely. So we do have many examples. Um, we're still actually learning more about them. I have three in particular that come to mind. One that relates to the Jones family, one that relates to Isaac B, and one that relates to a young girl by the name of Hannah. I love all of these examples because they show you how you can look at different sources and analyze them and to really understand the agency of these children and place their humanity and their ingenuity at the forefront of this conversation. So the first one comes actually from a book that was published by a, a gentleman named Colonel Lafayette Jones called My Great, 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 Great Grandfather's Journey to an Island of Freedom. Um, it's similar in how he writes it to um, an oral history, um, just in the, in the way that he talks, the way that he writes. Um, and he's spoken quite a bit about his family history. He's um, descended from the Jones family, free black family in Williamsburg. But he writes about how his family, who is free, um, eventually moves to an area called the Hot Water Tract, which is really the first large um, property or area just outside of Williamsburg after the American Revolution, where there's a very large free Black community. And he actually writes, I think if I remember it correctly, it's on page, it's somewhere between page 20 and page 22. He talks in particular about how enslaved people would hide out in the hot water tract in his family, because they were some of what he calls, quote, the first Black educators, end quote, in Williamsburg. Um, that they're writing them passes to get them out on the James River, onto ships, out of Virginia. And I think it's a really great example of how this free Black family is really supporting and helping their entire community through this education, not in the way the Bray Associates had intended, which I think is really important. Um, when it comes to Isaac B, what we know about him comes from two different runaway ads. Um, runaway ads, obviously, you always have to look at 
and understand their, well, really any source has bias, but these are biased because they're coming from the perspective of an enslaver who is looking at um, returning what they perceive as their property, but it's a human being to their ownership because of financial and economic reasons. But if you sift through the bias of these documents, you can learn quite a bit about these enslaved individuals, what languages they knew, what skills they had, what clothes they wore, what they liked, what they disliked. Um, and in one runaway ad from 1774, um, Isaac B. is described as his, by his enslaver as, quote, thinking he should have a right to his freedom because his father was a freeman, and I suppose he will endeavor to pass for one, end quote. It's one of the best examples we have of what another scholar, Diana Remy Berry, calls soul value enslaved people and free black people knowing I have a value outside of this financial institution that is slavery. And my value is not linked to what I'm quote unquote financially worth, but to who I am as a person and a human being. Um, and so I think those runaway ads tell us a lot. And then the last one is Hannah. Hannah was about 10 years old when this letter was written. It was actually written by Robert Carter Nicholas, who was one of the trustees of the Bray School. And he effectively says that Hannah is not um, attending to the instruction in the way that he wants. And he describes her, and I'm paraphrasing here, but he essentially describes her as being defiant and that this instruction is not making her subservient. But again, if you look through the bias, if you look past the bias of the document, what you see is that Hannah is resisting, not having instruction, she's resisting the way it's being taught to her. And so I think all of these examples, whether you're looking at a piece of correspondence, a runaway ad, or um, a history that's been passed down through oral legacy, all of these are great examples. So for you, Tanya, what challenges did you get end up getting those brick walls in your own genealogical research coming to find being descendant and how did you go through those challenges and break down the walls? Uh, so, right, the, the, the walls, you know, obviously are the very first wall that African-Americans run into is that 1870 census, right? Because that's the first one that lists us by name. So if you try to go back past that, that's where the walls come in. Um, it wasn't a lot of help for my search, but it is a, a help for, uh, for others. If, if you can't get past the 1870 census, look for the wills of the enslavers because that's where you'll see the names sometimes of enslaved individuals that are willed to family members. Um, I didn't find one particularly in my, in my search, um, but in some of the searches that we're doing um, for the Bray School, for example, um, that's where you're gonna find uh, the names of, of ancestors. Um, and then sometimes there'll be a, um, during the the land deed, when they got the land deeds, when they went south uh, to secure plantations and things, um, sometimes they were used for collateral. So you may find a name um, in some of those documents, um, but those are just a couple of ways to get through some of the challenges of getting past that 1870, 1870 census. So with reaching out to descendants and trying to connect, what is like a way to go about outside of the Williamsburg Bray School, if it's other schools or just kind of like descendant communities in general? Do you want to answer, Tanya? Oh, sorry. I didn't, I didn't know and you were going to. I was <laughs> muted. <laughs> oh, OK, I'm sorry. Uh, repeat that one more time, Whitney. I'm sorry. So how would you go about or ideas to reach out to those de that descendants communities in general, if it's like still with the Bray School, but not the Williamsburg Bray School, or just kind of like uh, a ge more general way to kind of reach right, out? Right, and because I actually them. had that um, experience when I was trying to get some information um, from the one in New York, uh, and because they they had they didn't have um, the name Bray. They were may maybe listed on, under something different. So if you're in Philadelphia, then I would go with um, the reference that Nicole provided earlier for the Philadelphia schools. Um, and then if you're looking for uh, the one in New York, you're going to want to go with um, Trinity Church and reach out to them to see um, if you can get information since that's where those. And then maybe Nicole can um, offer up the one for Rhode Island and um, Fredericksburg. Yeah, so I have to go back and pull the exact churches for Rhode Island and Fredericksburg because I want to be, I want to make sure if I don't know, I will say I don't know, but I can get you an answer. Um, but when it comes to Christ Church and Trinity, or pardon me, 
Christ Church and Trinity Church are the Protestant Episcopalian churches that are connected with these organizations. And then really talking with St. Thomas's AME Church in Philadelphia and also Mother Bethel, um, even though it's Baptist, you know, there's a lot of interconnectivity there. Um, still trying to learn more about how to connect to other places. The Black Loyalist Heritage Center in Nova Scotia is a really good place to look when it's to learn just about Black Loyalists in general, because there were several different race schools there. And then I'm actually taking a trip to Nassau in the Bahamas and visiting their special archives so that I can learn more from them on what is a good point of contact for people and see if I have anything in my collection um, that would be helpful to those community members that are down in Nassau. Um, when it comes to Virginia more broadly, really the Bray School Lab, William and Mary's Bray School Lab is the place to go. Um, and, you know, if you're still not sure after this or you're like, I, just, I need this very specific thing and I don't know where to look please email us at braylab at wm.edu. If we don't know the answer, we will help you figure out who should know the answer or who we can get you in contact with. Also, if you go to our website, William and Mary's Bray School Lab, you'll also find under contact information, um, you will find Elizabeth Drembus's email and she's our genealogist. So if you have specific questions on how do I do this, um, please feel free. Um, to reach out to her. And also we'll be doing more genealogy workshops moving forward probably in Virginia um, and finding ways to make, make them more accessible um, broadly. So oh, Nicole, you mentioned schools in Nova Scotia. How would you go about locating that list of what the schools were and if, can kind of say, if your ancestors attended those schools? Absolutely. I can help with that. So if you want, you can always email, email me at ncbrown at wm.edu. I can put my email in the chat as well. Um, but one of the things I'd recommend is British Online Archives. It is a subscription database. So you may have to go to your local university or library to see if they have access. But all of the um, scans of the documents, including student lists and letters, are up there. That being said, I've done a lot of work on the Nova Scotia Bray schools in particular. There were schools in Digby in Shelburne and in Halifax. There were lots of different lists. And so if you have a particular name you'd like me to look at, or if you say, could you please send me your transcriptions? I'm always of the mind, I wanna be as open accent as, and transparent as, a, as an academic as I can be. So if there's something I can personally do to help you um, find that information, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Any Bray schools or Bray school equivalents in Mississippi? Oh, that you come across? Not that I can think of, but I don't know. It's a good question. Let, you know, and I think <laughs> this is why I'm so glad you've asked this question because I don't know is a perfectly acceptable answer, but we can't stop there, right? Um, one of the reasons I would say I don't know is because Mississippi, depending on what period of time you're looking at it, it's a Spanish colony and then it's a French colony, and then it's an English colony, or then it's American. So I would say you might have to have a different avenue. My guess is there's not a Bray school in Mississippi because Bray schools were Church of England. That being said, it might be worth looking into what different Catholic organizations were in Mississippi in particular, especially in the colonial period. Because just because there wasn't an English charity school doesn't really necessarily mean anything because Mississippi actually wasn't controlled by the British at this point in time, right? And then do you have any contacts or info for Bermuda? So I'm still working on getting more contacts for Bermuda. Um, the local Protestant Episcopalian church in Nassau in particular was the church that was affiliated with the Nassau Bray School. However, um, Methodists, in, there's a wonderful book, it's escaping me right now, but it's all about Methodism and Methodism in the, um, in the Bahamas. In Bermuda, there's a little bit of information for Bray schools. It's slightly different. Um, so still doing research on that. Don't have as much as I'd like for Bermuda, but we're starting to go through the minute meetings of the Bray Associates. And we did just discover there was a Bermuda Bray school in the 1760s, but I don't know a lot more than that right now. 
And then I know you mentioned that there maybe weren't schools set up, but books were sent. Is there a good resource for finding where books might have been sent to see if they had still some of that kind of training, but not with the actual school? So again, most of that, because it's not open access yet, is available on British online archives. Again, that's a big part of our work at the Bray School Lab is to make more of this information available through online access. If you have questions about a particular area or region, though, if you reach out to braylab at wm.edu, very likely that will be referred to me and I can help you find the information you're looking for, um, which, you know, I think that also speaks to not that this information isn't out there, it's out there. But the research that we're doing is new in the academic field. So you all asking these questions is what helps us move towards making sure that the questions get answered that should be answered, quite frankly. Um, so I'm really appreciative for all these questions. I don't know, Tanya, if you wanted to add anything. To no, I'm good. That's good. <laughs> So I guess what other just, I guess, researching in general, the schools, I guess, Tanya, I can give this question to you first. Okay. What challenges are coming in with researching it because it's a new way and it's like more newer findings, even though the, research, the resources have been out there? Right. So um, I, unfortunately, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not the genealogist, but I do work very closely with her. Uh, and so I can say for her, um, the challenges is just because of um, the separation of families inside the institution of slavery, um, the, the the lack of documentation, um, and then also with the ro rosters that we have, they only list those students by first name. Um, so we do have the names of the enslavers. Um, again, that's where the wills and, and documentation is coming in, inventories, inventory lists that list the names, um, may list the names of, of the enslaved, um, but for this particular project, one of the biggest challenges is we have the rosters that only list the children by their first names. <clears throat> so as historians and in your work with descendants, what av advice would you give to other historians trying to connect with descendants, not just the Bray School, but like broader, so there's like general descendants communities with histories? Right, for for myself, directed that? Yeah, both okay. of you. <laughs> um, one of the best of, best uh, things that I can tell people, um, the advice that I can give, don't don't think that you're, you may not be uh, a descendant community member. Please don't think that because um, my my case, um, I I'm, was born in Alabama. My family cluster is out of Alabama. And so we had always known that our family, you know, came from Virginia. A lot of people, you know, they think, no, my, my, I'm from California. I'm from Oregon. I'm from Utah. You know, there's no way please do the research because you'd be very surprised um, to find out that when um, when cotton boomed and all of those families left Virginia and moved all over, they went from my, uh, the fourth great grandfather that I mentioned, Peter F. Armistead, he had con plantations in Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi. That's in the oral history that I, I presented. It said that he, he and his wife separated. He moved to Padola County, Mississippi. I actually had a, a, a DNA match reach out to me because she had found her line descended from that same county where he ended up at with the same last name, Armistead. And so um, do the research and don't think that there's not a way that you could potentially be um, a descendant community member because you could, um, because everything started in Virginia. <laughs> so everything's going to lead back there. I think when it comes to engaging more broadly, and I'm going to speak about this sort of from my positionality, right? I'm not African American. I'm not a descendant. Um, I started with this work as um, as a museum professional, actually portraying um, the teacher who was the teacher of the Bray School. If you're going to do this kind of work, from my standpoint, you have to actually listen. You need to stop talking, and you need to listen. Um, you have to be open and it's a constant relationship, right? You can't just say, oh, I've been out in front of the descendant community once, that's enough. You need to be constantly building your relationship and trust because that has to be earned, especially in the case of many public universities, universities, museums. There's a lot of damage that universities and museums have done historically, especially during the Jim Crow era, um, to silencing black voices and black narratives. So if you wanna do this kind of work, you have to commit 
You have to be there to listen and you have to be there to listen, even if it's going to be something that maybe you don't want to hear, because in if you shut yourself off from really truly hearing what dissenting community members are saying to you, you're not actually going to be able to do the work that is required. Um, so here's what I mean by that. Uh, when I, and this is just for me personally, when I started doing research on Ann Wager, I had to be prepared to grapple with my own denomination. I'm Protestant Episcopalian being deeply racist and um, profoundly hurtful to descendant community members and saying, how am I going to reckon with this in a way that supports the kinds of questions that the descendants want to be answered? So to that point, the last thing I'll say is don't assume what answers your communities want answered. Really listen and make sure that you're listening to what they're telling you, right? There's a difference between what a museum professional may think should be a question that should be answered as opposed to what's a question that needs to be asked. It's one of the reasons why I'm so appreciative um, just for all the questions that have been asked today because some of them I've never been asked before and I get so excited every time that happens because it means that it's a question that needs to be answered. Um, so that's, that's my advice. Yeah. And then just kind of start wrapping it up. You mentioned Robert Carter Nicholas. Can you just explain more of who that was? And there's a lot of different Robert Carter Nicholas to make sure like when doing research so that they're looking at the right one. <laughs> was that for me? Oh, yeah, you talk about it, Tanya. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I did see somebody, a question in the chat. They were asking me if this was the, it was at the uh, Robert Carter the first, um, I believe. Which, which? It's his grandson. Okay, okay. Yeah, Robert, <laughs> I didn't want to answer something. No, 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 you're good. So Robert King Carter is Robert Carter the first. Oh, yes, right. I'm so sorry. Right. Yes. No, no, yes. you're fine. <laughs> um, but, that's, but that's the tricky thing with all these records. Everybody's related to everybody. Free right. and enslaved, right. black and right. white, right? right? So Robert Carter Nicholas is his grandson. Yes, yes. Right. His cousin, who is also Robert Carter the first's grandson, is Robert Carter the third. Yeah, it, it was on that uh, tree that on this in the slides, we had it in the tree. We just didn't have enough room to enlarge it so you could see all of the names. I'm so sorry. Um, but I I was referring to uh, Robert Carter Nicholas, the administrator of the Bray School. And, uh, and Nicole just clarified that for us. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> if there's any last minute questions that need to be, that want to be answered. I think. Pretty much all of them, and oh, I'm so. Can I can I say yes. one more? No, you're good. I, was, I was typing this out, um, and I'm not going to be able. Uh, there's a question um, about as as historians and in your work with descendants. What advice would you give other historians to try to connect with descendants? My answer to that, and I, I didn't get a chance to get it all in. Um, there's a rubric. It's called engaging with descendant community members. Um, you can Google it and and get it, but that is pretty much our guide in doing the work that Nicole and I and Elizabeth do with the Bray School that I highly recommend for those who want to work with dissenting community members or dissenting communities in general. That rubric is available online and people can just research and also include Dr. Michael Blakey's name and it won't pop up. Mm -hmm. make sure to have y'all have the rest of y'all Saturday. So I just want to thank y'all for coming and thank Nicole and Tanya for being panelists on the webinar. It was a great presentation, a lot of good information shared. I know I learned a lot, um, even more than already I had known. And just for everyone, make sure we have a next, our next webinar is September 23rd at 1 p.m. And it's a discussion about universities studying slavery and a search for descendants of the enslaved who were at the universities.